Welcome everyone. If you could find your way to your seats and uh, get yourself comfortable, we're going to get ready to start the shear. Uh, we want to thank everyone for coming out for this special evening. We're a great honor to hear speak Rabbi Rahimi coming all the way from Lakewood. Um, we want to give a thank you to Congregation Tov for opening up the shul. As they always do, we partner Chazak and Cong Congregation Tov throughout the year on many events. And uh, just allowing them to open their doors and to help spread Torah into the community. And a special thanks to our sponsors for, the, for this evening, the Matayo family, who dedicated this evening for Louis Nishmat, Rosa Tzviya, Bat Chuzni, Mer Neshama, Heaven Aliyah. Amen. And uh, just like tonight, Chazak organizes many events, hundreds of events throughout the year, many different communities with, with your sites and dedications. And tonight's um, was, was also the, the yurt site of Shmuel Moshe Ben Hachafer Meir, as well as uh, many others throughout the year. We do these yurt sites and dedication events. So if you want to dedicate an event like this uh, for yourself, you can reach out to Chazak to do that. And additionally, Chazak, along with their events, their main focus is actually impacting the public school students through many daily after-school programs um, in over 15 different locations, and also a dedicated division that is called PSTY, Public, public School to Yeshiva, where we help transfer uh, Jewish kids from public school into Yeshiva, where Baruch Hashem, we've transferred over 1,300 kids into the yeshivas. And Amir uh, Tashem will have many, many more with, uh, with your help. And um, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is an instrumental role in the Mishnah Ruah Tiferet project, as well as a renowned speaker in Mechazek, who has spoken many times for Chazak and many other organizations. So please welcome Rabbi Rahimi. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, um, Tov Shul, for having me. I am related, I think, to the founders of the Shul, the Nisanyan family. My brother-in-law is uh, David Nisanyan, who's the son of Rabbi Avram Nisanyan, and his mother, Alea Shalom Golda. For those who recognize her, Golda Nisanyan, Alea Shalom, passed away a couple years ago. So I do have a little bit of a shaykh to the family. Remember, he asked me, do I ever heard of Tov Shul? I said, of course. Officially, we're family. <laughs> Thank you for the Chazak organization. As usual, always doing great work, spreading Torah, Judaism everywhere. I was at a convention last week, a big cure of convention where you have rabbis from literally across the globe this time, from Brazil, from Chile, from England, from Belgium, Russia. We met the chief rabbi of Russia. It was the coolest thing. I'm walking around over there in the lobby hotel and people came over to me from England, from all these different places, and like, oh, you're Yaakov Rahim. I said, yes, from the Chazak organization. I was like, yes. So Chazak is across the world. It's not only in Queens, it's recognized as a powerful organization across the world, spreading Torah. And Hashem should give them a kachot to keep on going with strength, patience, and a lot of money. This year is the Unishmat. Am I mentioning somebody? Rosa Tzviya, Bat Kuzni, Kuzni. Hashem should give you the Nishama Mala Mala Began Eden. You know, Olam Abba is not Pashut, Rabbi The next world is not Pashut. It's not an easy, uh, it's not a free ride. When once a person after 120 years goes to Olam Abba, it's not a free ride. Akadosh Baruch Hu is Metakdek, Hashem. Every detail of a person's life, even if we forgot, which most of the time we forget what happened in the past, Hashem never forgets the good and the bad, the mitzvot and the avirot. It could be many years ago when you were 20 years old, you were nice to your friend in school. You were about to speak the Shona and you stopped. You forgot about it. You know who didn't forget about it? HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Betin Shemala, after 120, Hashem is medaktek, Hashem is careful, Hashem remembers everything that a person did. So having a shiul, liyuni shmat somebody, no matter how great of a tzaddik they were, it helps tremendous in shamaim. We don't see it in this world. It's like imagine a person, I got to visit one time, I got to visit people in jail, Jewish people in jail, a certain type of organization, you go give them chizik, it was one of the best experiences I ever had, not to their offense, I wish they weren't there, 
But I'm saying as a rabbi, going to such a place, it was an eye-opening thing how really free we are. We think being in traffic is called being in jail. You don't know what you're talking about. Go to real jail, see what goes on over there. You think walking home and the house is a mess. You think that's, oh, that's Yisuim. That's not Yisuim. Go to jail. You see what goes on in jail. It's an eye-opening thing how much freedom we have, how much time we have in our fingers. But what does the person do with the free time? Spends it on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, boo, boo, the whole life, the whole life, spending and spending and spending. What are you doing? You're in jail with your phone. You know, it's this unbelievable thing. A person's life can be intercepted and kidnapped by the iPhones. A person's life can literally be kidnapped and intercepted by the iPhones. You know how much time people spend on their phones? You can go crazy. Hashem gave you such a beautiful life. Health, a beautiful world, so much Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Chacham Ovadia, Shulchan Aruch, Gemara, Shabbat, Amotzi Lechem in Ares, Tefillin, Prayer, Chesed. Why did Hashem give us such a beautiful world? Such a high neshama, high soul that every single one of us as the Jewish people, did He give it to us to stop spending on iPhones? Spending on social media? Spending a chas shalom watching Netflix? That's what Hashem gave you a high neshama for? Come on. Imagine, you know, they say, the fancier the wedding is, the wealthier the people are making the wedding. That's usually the rule. I went to a big wedding the other day in, 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 um, in Brooklyn. What a fancy wedding. Even the hallway, I think they hired like a whole zoo. I saw like giraffes and cows and horses. I don't know what was going on over there, but it was a very, very fancy wedding. And I know whose wedding it was because it was a very wealthy guy. He doing this a lot. That was a fancy wedding. Just walking into the hall, you can see, whoa, this guy's got money. Sometimes you can walk into a wedding, the flowers are fake, the food is okay, you know, the, the lights, the settings. So you know, okay, they're not so wealthy. Important people, but they're not so wealthy. Hashem created this world. Beautiful world. You know how deep the oceans are? We just learned about this other Titanic that just sunk. I saw pictures of it. You see how deep the water is? How scary is that? The ocean is so deep. It's beyond our minds how massive and complex nature is in this world. As much as we think we discovered the world, we're not even close to halfway discovering what's going on in the world, even in the water. All the animals, all the birds, all the bugs, all the fish. And why did Hashem create this whole beautiful world? Why did Hashem create such a beautiful stage, such a beautiful setting? For what? For a person to spend time on his iPhone? For a person to fight with other people? For a person to run after money his whole life? That's why Hashem created such a beautiful world. No way, no way. There has to be a greater purpose. If Hashem made such a beautiful world, that means the people He created to use the world are beautiful. They have high neshamot. Hashem has high expectations of us. What is that expectation, Zabotai? That is to overcome bad. Work on our midot. Work on being good people. Baal Chesed, learning Torah, more mitzvot, saying no to sins, no to the Yetzara. Hashem has high expectations of what we're supposed to perform in this world, and that is to become great people. What defines great? Not wealth, not fame, not properties, not products. What defines great? How much Torah and mitzvot a person is involved in on a daily basis. How nice is the person to his wife, or the wife to her husband, you know, I just read this morning, and Chacham Rabbi, remind me to go back to what I prepared. I just read this morning from the Gaum of Vina something so scary, and I hope you don't mind that I'm sharing it with you, but it's, it's Kishmak, it's very good. The Gaum of Vina writes, Le'atid lavo after 120, when a person goes to Olam Abba, you have a person that was good, ben adam lemakom, but ra leberiot, which means when it comes to the relationship with God, with mitzvot, he was a good guy. He kept Shabbat, he learned Torah, kosher was top top, Jewish education for his kids, don't worry about it, top top, everything was good. But when it came to the briot, when it came to treating others, ay ay ay, this guy needs to work on himself, wasn't the nicest guy. Learns, learns, learns. Give tzedakah, give tzedakah, beautiful. But when he comes home, boom, slaps his wife. Eh, what's going on? Give tzedakah, such a nice guy. When he comes home, treats his wife like a who knows what, chas shalom. Then, says the Gaul you can have a person that when it came to being nice to others, 
Nice is like a vague thing, but what I mean to say nice to the briot, it means as a person that was a good guy, that really wanted the good for other people, that really helped him out. He was a good to the briot, but ralamakom, he wasn't good with God, with mitzvot. Shabbat wasn't the best, tzedakah wasn't the best, kashrut wasn't the best. He had to work on it. Says the Gaul Mavina, what is the difference between the two people, the two options? The person that was good with Hashem, but not a good guy with others. When he finishes Gehenom, because Gehenom cleans your sins, even though he finished his time, he served his time. I once met a guy that was a criminal. He became a janitor. He told me a famous line. He was in jail for many years. So he told me, Rabbi, let me tell you a line. If you, can't, if you can't serve the crime, no. If you can't serve the time, don't commit the crime. That's what you told me. You hear this line? If you can't serve the time, don't commit the crime. That's what this guy told me. He told me a big lesson. Averot are not worth it. Sins are not worth it. Because if you will know what happens when a person sins, if you can't serve the time in the next world, don't commit the crime. It's all, everything is off. Everything is done. Besides the relationship with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, a person who unfortunately falls for the Yitzhara, what happens to the person? It's based on science. You know what happens to the person? He detaches himself from God. And the more you detach away from Hashem, the less happy you will be. The more you connect to Hashem with Torah Mitzvot, the happier the person will be. The more light you will have in his life, the more all you will have in your life. I never met Tzadikim, and I met Baruch Hashem, a lot of Tzadikim. None of them were sad. None of them were depressed. None of them were complaining. They were just happy, good people, smiling, not complaining, happy. And what do they have already? They have a massive house. You know, the Rosh Hashiv, Rosh Hashiv, Rosh Hashiv, Rosh he's a big tzaddik. You ever go to his house, you're going to be shocked. What do you think he has in his house already? He still has those phones with the cords. Maybe some of you still have, you know, those phones with the cords? He still, if you're trying to reach him, he still goes, eh, eh, eh. Tell him, Rosh Hashiv, we got to get going. You know, I'm trying to reach you. What's going on? Eh, eh, eh. He says, no. I like to stay the way it was over the years. He still has the old phone. A couch, this couch, he has one small couch in his living room. It's ripped. You think he can't afford a new couch? You think he didn't have donors coming to him and saying, Rabbi, we'll buy you a couch. He's not interested. Why is he not interested? It doesn't talk to him. He doesn't care. His focus and his purpose is much greater and bigger. What's that focus? More Torah and more mitzvah. That's why he's a Rish Yeshiva. All he does is learn Torah. You know, one time... In yeshiva, remind me to go back, Rabbi, again to that shot. One time in yeshiva, me and my friends are walking. It was a Thursday night. Thursday night in yeshiva, we have something called Mishmar night, where you stay up extra Thursday night and you learn more and you hang out with friends. You have cholent, you have cake, good times in yeshiva. So one time in Lake it was basically in the middle of the night. It must have been like three in the morning. Me and my friends leave yeshiva and we walk to our dorm. And when we walk to our dorm, we have to pass by the Rosh Yeshiva's apartment. He lives in an apartment building by there, a beautiful motion. You have to pass the Rosh Yeshiva's apartment. We peeked through the window because the lights were on. So we went to the, it was a little open, the, how do you call it, the tris, the, what's, how do you say, the, the shades. The curtains were a little open. And we see inside, he's making copies. He has a copy machine. He was making copies of farm. The next morning when I saw him in yeshiva, when he gave shir, I said to him, yeshiva, you know, you don't have to make the copies anymore of this farm. Make me the copy man. I want to have the zechut to make the copies. Call me whenever you need me. I make the copies. He tells me, no, Yaakov, you don't understand. There's no official time when I make copies. And most of the time, it happens in the middle of the night. I tell me, Shiv, you don't go to sleep? He's like, what? Go to sleep. I have to prepare shir for Friday, and then Friday afternoon, Gemara, then a Chumash, then on Shabbat, and then this, and then this. It's not that they're not tired. It's that they don't have time to go to sleep. It's a whole different level. There's no time to go to sleep. They nap a little bit. I once ate by him Friday night. He barely ate. His wife, the Rebinson, Gave him such a nice plate. There was a nice piece of chicken on his plate, by the way. Nice piece of chicken, rice, carrots. He hardly ate. He had like one bite just for Shabbat Kodesh to have chicken. Vizel. And his rabbit is telling him, Yerucham, Yerucham, Yerucham. He's trying to eat, eat a little bit. And he's falling asleep, and he's falling asleep. He fell asleep. But what did he do? Listen to this. He fell asleep during the meal. But after the meal, him and his wife, the rabbit said, listen to this. Every Friday night, him and his wife go on a 30-minute walk alone. 30 minute walk alone, him and his wife, they spend time together. To this day, they do it. The Rosh Hashiva of Lakewood. A person who's Machshiv Torah, nothing else talks to him. It's not that they have a tithe of red. Nothing talks to him. You know what it's like, Lahavdil? It's like imagine you go, remind me to go back. Imagine you go to a very big trip. What's the funnest trip you ever went on, huh? What's the funnest trip you ever went on? 
You don't have to share it. What's the funnest trip I ever went on? Let's see. Uh, funnest trip. We went to the Poconos with the family. That was nice. Poconos was nice. We rented a house, Airbnb. We had a pool. We played volleyball. It's geschmack. Always you come from Lakewood, right, to New York? Yeah. You have fun also with traffic. <laughs> <laughs> traffic is so boring. I'm just saying, <laughs> really boring. You know the Rish Hashiva of Aaron Walken, Zechet Salvi Kolesh Shivracha. He used to travel in from Lakewood to Queens for Chazak, for to spread terror in the yeshiva. I once asked him, Rabbi Noshir Olam, he was in his, I think it was in his 50s already. I said, how do you do it? A guy like you, you can be a Rish Hashiva on Lakewood, you have so much Torah, you can have so many Talmudim. You're driving, sitting in traffic to Queens? And he says, you taught me a tremendous lesson. And I tell it to myself when I'm sitting in traffic, because the other day I drove to Long Island. From Lakewood to Long Island, it was two hours and 45 minutes. That's very boring. Okay. So I asked him, so how did you do it? See, so he tells me, every person has his dose of pain in this world. There's no getting away free. Every person has their sack of yisuim, of pain. You choose where you want it to be. I'm choosing, my traveling is my pain, but I want my family to be healthy and I can learn Torah. That's what he told me. My pain is my traveling, no problem, but the rest is free. That's our Arn Walker It's a tremendous lesson. Every person chooses where they want their pain. You know, the Kutzke Rebbe said, everybody complains about their suffering in their life. But he says, let's say we're able to, be ta- we're able to take, every person will put all their tsarot, all their pain, in a bag, in a shopping bag. And then you go to Times Square, and every person puts in a pile, like a huge mountain, everybody drops their pain in the bag, they chop it in Times Square. Everybody takes their tsarot, let it go, take it out. Put it in Times Square. Then Hashem says, every person, go choose which Yisurim you want. You're not happy with yours? Go choose the other guys. Says the Katzke Rebbe, every person will go choose their Yisurim, their struggles. Why? Because Hashem only gives struggles to a person that only they can survive and live through and get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How in the world did I get to this? What are we up to? The what? Oh, the Gomer Vina. Thank you, Tzaddik. So the Gomer Vina said like this. So he says in Olam Abba, the person that wasn't nice to other people so much, but he was good with mitzvahs, even though when he finishes Gehenom, he can't leave Gehenom. He's still in room A called Gehenom. He finishes time, but he can't leave. The only way he can leave to go to Gan Eden, says the Gomer Vina, is only if a Tzaddik from his generation comes and pulls him out. And then he says, you have the other person. The person that was nicer to others, and I'll explain what nicer means, more particular. But he wasn't the best guy with mitzvot. Such a guy, he says, when he finishes Gehenom, he leaves room Gehenom. But he's right in front of Gan Eden, he doesn't go right in, but at least he leaves room Gehenom, and he's right in front of room Gan Eden. Which means, says the Gohan Mavina, a person that's rude to others in this world, even when you finish Gehenom, you're not leaving. But a person that's actually good, Ben Adam and respects others, when he finishes Gehenom, don't worry, they're going to kick you out. Eventually you're going to enter Gehenom, but at least you're out of Gehenom. I learned from this a little bit, a tremendous lesson. Ben Adam is serious stuff. Respecting others is serious. It's not a one-time thing only on Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah. This is an everyday job. How many opportunities in our day do we have to actually respect others or chas v'shalom the other way, disrespect others? You come to shul in the morning. For example, you come to shul in the morning, you're about to enter our parking spot, and the guy, pshoo, gets right in there. Huh? You just messed up. You go inside the shul, you're about to put your tefillin down, you're about to dive in, another guy comes and says, oh, this is my spot. You're about to leave first, you open the door, he opens the door. You go to work, who knows how many times you can miss a Z or bully other people. Person comes home, who knows what can happen? The way he talks to his wife, the way he talks to his kids. This is a dangerous thing. Ben Adam is a serious, serious thing. I want to share with you what Ben Adam means. Because somebody, who just asked me that? No, that was a different lecture. Somebody asked me, define me exactly what it means to respect another person. Because I don't want to sound vague. So I'll share with you a story about Rabbi Yochum Levavitz, the famous Meshgiach of the Mir in Europe. One time, he was going on a train in Europe, and the doors were closing in on him by the train. You know, like you have in the subway, 
watch for the closing doors. You gotta watch for the doors. The doors were closing in on him, and his foot, as he was hopping on the train, got stuck, so his shoe fell out. Before the door closes fully, the rabbi did like a 180 or a 360, whatever you call it. He took off his shoe, fishing, chucked it out the door. So now two shoes are out. His Talmudim, I asked him, Rabbi, you lost one shoe, why you lose the other? He tells him, what do you mean? Somebody is going to find that shoe. Why let them have one pair of shoes? Let them have a full pair of shoes. Now what's the lesson from the story? This is a deep story, you know why? Only a person that always thinks about other people, only a person that's in his mind is helping others, can think so fast before the door closes to turn around and throw out the other shoe. Some people will think maybe the next day about it, oh, I should have, you know what, I should have thrown the other shoe out because anyway, someone's going to find it. Some people may not think about it at all. Some people may be an hour later. Rabbi Yucham Levavitz, within a second, was able to think about the person that's going to come and pick up the shoe, so let me give him my other shoe. How does a person think about that so fast when it's always on his mind? Ben Adam when he's always thinking, how can I respect, how can I respect? A person who's always like that can be able to think in a split second to help another person. That's Ben Adam Echavero. Ben Adam Echavero is not only once in a while to give a compliment, once in a while to be nice. It's not like going to a pizza shop once a week or going to a restaurant with your wife once a month. Ben Adam Echavero is life. You got to live it. It's life. It's every day. How can I help you? What can I do for you? Did I, God forbid, chasu, did I disrespect you? I want to ask you, mechila. Always respecting others. That's ben adam lechavero. Always to go out of your, it's a mindset, it's a vision. To always go out of your way and help at other people. I spoke to Rabbi Yucham Moshe, so I said another story about him, even though I said it a million times on Torah anytime. But who cares, right, Rabbi? <laughs> said again, beautiful story. When I was around 16, 17 years old, it was ben azman in time, almost now summertime, when yeshiva is off, Rabbi Oshin gave me the zechut to merit to learn with him once a week, twice a week. He wanted to give me chizuk. It was like chesed, you know? So I took the offer, of course. I went to yeshiva. I learned with him. As we're learning, it was during lunchtime. As we're learning in yeshiva, a very old man walks in with the thing, the agala thing, walker. the walker. Sorry for my English. He walks in. Rabbi Yucham Oshin, the Rosh Yeshiva. If you want to chacham Google him, you can see how old he is. He has a long white beard. He gets up, he jumps up, and he runs towards this old man that was clean-shaven. I asked her, Shishiva Mize, who is this? Tells me, ah, this. He was my Rebbe when I was in school. He taught me Torah. He taught me Torah. His Rebbe, the old man, points to me, and he asks Rebbe Yochum, who's, who's this guy? Like, he points to me, my, the little guy over here. Who's this guy? So Rebbe Yochum Moshe tells him, ah, oh, he's a friend of mine. We're hanging out, Ben Azmanim. You hear what he said? He's a friend of mine. We're hanging out. Ben is on him. This is a Rosh Yeshiva of Lakewood. You want to meet Rosh Yeshiva of Lakewood? Habibi, 8,000 students. What does that mean? And then he calls the little me, 16-year-old, on, on the spot. Who is he? He didn't say, oh, he's my student. I'm his rabbi. That's not what he said. He said right away, oh, this guy, he's a friend of mine. We hang out Ben Azmanim. It shows how humble Rabbi Yucham Oshin is. That shows Anava. But how do you think of it so fast to answer that? How do you think to say that so fast? It's not like you had to catch his thoughts. It's not like you said, I'm his rabbi. Oh, never mind, I'm his friend. You said naturally right away, I'm his friend. How do you think of it so fast? Because he's always thinking like that for real. Every time he's walking or his mind is, he's always thinking, I am his friend. I'm here to help him out. I'm here to do chesed. When you're always thinking, ben adam it becomes your nature automatically. That's what it means a person has to work on ben adam lechavero. It's a vision, it's a lifestyle, it's a mindset to always look for others and help them out. The other day, unfortunately, I met a, a couple that um, they were not having shalom bite. Now, I'm not good at shalom bite at all. You could call my wife and ask her. You know, that's not the case. But this couple was an obvious one. I mean, come on. The comments that I was able to see in the room, a lot of disrespect, a lot. I don't even know how it's possible to get to such a point. A lot of disrespect. So I told him, I don't know, I said, for how many years are you guys speaking to each other like this? This, that, this, that. If there's no ben adam lechaver, if there's no partial respect, you know, the, the Torah tells us, even Paro, Paro was evil. Paro was a rasha. Paro killed 
little Jewish babies just for their blood. He was evil. When Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to be mezalzel in paro, when he, when he wanted to make fun and belittle paro, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, you're not allowed to do that. Because at the end of the day, paro is the king. A king is the king. He's evil. I'll punish him. But you're not allowed to belittle paro. He's a human being. He's a king. That's a tremendous lesson. When the Mitzrim, when the Egyptians were drowning in the Yamsuf, when Kaiso crossed Kriyat Yamsuf, the sea, the Egyptians that killed and were lashing the Jews all these years were finally dying in the sea. The Melachim, the angels, the Midrash tells us, started singing songs. Woohoo! Yay! Egyptians are dead! Hashem told the Melachim, Alo, 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 Shh! My biriyot, my creations are dying. My creations are dying out and being, destro and being uh, destroyed, and you're singing? That's what the Midrash says. Here's another tremendous lesson. Even though they were evil, and finally we got our revenge, but to sing on their death? Says Hashem, where's your respect to a human being? What a tremendous lesson. Respect to a human being. Another rise, Gemara and Megillah with Esther Malka. Esther Malka with King Achashverosh. She, like David the Melech says, she said, save me from this Kelev. You know, in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, calling someone a dog, a Kelev, is like the worst. One time in the news, this uh, Abbas guy called Bibi Netanyahu a Kelev. That was like, whoa, he called him a Kelev, he called him a dog. For the Muslims, a Kelev is very bad. Esther Maka called the Chashverosh a Kelev. She told Hashem, Hashem, save me from this dog. Then a sentence later, says David the Melech, she, she switched her words in her prayer. Save me from the Aliyah. Save me from the lion. She called the Chashverosh a lion. She went from a dog, which is nothing, to a lion. Why? Esther Maka, why did you switch your prayers? Asked the Gemara and Megillah. Says the Gemara, you know why? Because Hashem told Esther Maka, I'm going to take away your Ruach HaKodesh. You're calling a Chashverosh a dog? He's not a dog. He's the king of 127 countries. He's a massive guy. He was talking about was a big guy. But he was a massive guy. He could control a lot. You can't just call somebody who is a human being and a high figure a dog. Don't change reality. Call him a lion because he really is a lion. He really is dangerous. However, says Hashem, I'm even greater than a Chashverosh. Emuna is not denying reality. Emuna is facing reality. Again, Emuna is not denying a, a situation to make believe as if it's not happening. There's fights going on, Chas Shalom, where things are not going well. No, everything is fine, everything is fine. No, no. Everything is not fine, but Hashem is even bigger, so watch how it's going to be fine. Emunah is not denying reality. Emunah is actually facing reality that no matter what you're going through, Hashem is even bigger. That's Emunah. So over here, Hashem told the Stera Maka, why are you calling the Chashverosh Kelev as if he's nothing? He's something. He's a lion. He's dangerous. Don't make believe he's not dangerous, but remember that I'm even stronger than a Chashverosh. You trust in me, you're going to beat him. That's Emunah. But what do we learn from those three cases? That even evil people, you got to be careful with that, but even evil people, they're human beings. There's got to be a certain common denominator of respect. So how in the world did a husband and a wife end up like this? How is that possible? How? What, what, what's going on? What, where's the decent Ben Adam the regular, the regular common denominator? Ben Adam the is a serious thing. You know, I once read a letter. Remind me to go back, Chacham Rabbi. Go back to the book. Okay, I'll tell you one last thing. I once read a letter from a Yisrael Weintraub. Zechitzad of Yekod Very big rabbi. We had this chut to see him. He passed away in 2004, 2005. He was American originally. Then he went to El Tzisayim in Aliyah. One of the biggest gedolim that we have. One of the biggest rabbis. His name is Yisrael Weintraub. Zechitzad of Yekod So he has a book of letters about Chinuch, Shlom Bayit, Ben Adam Lechaver. He wrote there a tremendous letter to a husband that was having issues with his wife at home. He had Shlom Bayit issues. He told them that when he walks home from work, when he walks into the house after work, the house is a mess. Supper is not ready. Chaos. And he gets bekas. He gets mad. So Ber Weinshop told him a tremendous lesson, and you can use it in everything in life, not only Shlom Bayit. He told him, if you will walk into your friend's house, not your house, you walk to your friend's house after work, and you see his house is a mess. The kids are pulling the tablecloth. The daughters are pulling each other's hair. Ketchup is on the floor. Milk is spilling. The food is overflowing. Would you get very upset at your friend's house? No. Why not? 
His kids are doing the same exact thing your kids are doing at your house. What's the difference, your friend's house and your house? The answer is, your friend's house, you don't feel like you have control. It's my friend's house. It's not mine. I don't have control over it. It's my friend's. You, get, you don't get mad at all, or maybe you get mad a little bit, but you don't really get mad at all. No cuss. Your house, says Robert Weintraub, when you walk in, you think you're in charge. You think everything is yours. Everything has to go your way. So when you think everything has to go your way, when it does it, you become because you get mad. He told them, you have to learn how to let go. Let go. You know what Emunah is? Emunah is to let go. <laughs> We're not in control of our lives. Hashem is in control of everything. Emunah is to let go. He told them, let go. Don't think you own your kids. Don't think you own your wife. Don't think you own your house. Take it easy. Hashem is in charge in your house too. That's a tremendous lesson. Person has to teach yourself to let go, whether it's in business, whether it's at work, whether it's in yeshiva. Hashem is in charge. When you think you're in charge of everything, that's when the kaas and the balagan starts. I want to tell you a mashal. Oh, the book. Okay, last mashal, then we're going to continue. Hashem Yerachem. This always happens, by the way. I'll give you a refund if you want. Don't, uh... I'll tell you a mashal. Imagine the wealthy guys in the, who's the, uh, Elon Musk. Chacham Elon Musk. Good guy, Elon Musk. Imagine he's in the middle of a meeting. He has billionaires waiting for him in the main uh, office. What's it called? Uh, what? The Oval Office. Thank you. The main office. Chazak has an Oval Office and all the chashuvim. So he says, imagine he's running to the meeting. He's a few minutes late. He has a bunch of paper files. Elon Musk. And he's running and he's running down the hall. By mistake, there was a secretary. She made herself a cup of coffee, miskena. It's in the morning. She didn't realize, she goes in the hallway as Elon Musk is running, crash, boom. Coffee goes all over the place. The files are on the floor, papers. Elon Musk is too busy. He has so much money to make down the hall. He has no time to fight. Who, whose fault it is? My fault, your fault. Come on, just pick up the papers, let's go. I forgive you, forgive me, let's go already. I gotta go make billions. You think Elon Musk has time to sit there? Your fault. My fault, give me your number, I'm calling the cops, calling your parents, take it to court, see you in Betin. <laughs> Who has time for that? The guy has to make millions and billions of dollars. A person in this world, when you have the right vision while you're here in this world, when your eye is on the ball to accomplish Torah and mitzvot and chassadi, more Torah, more mitzvot, when you know how much billions of mitzvot you can accomplish, you have no time to fight. Who has time to fight? Go to Betin for a thousand dollars? You're going to fight a guy for 300? When you're busy and you have so many things to do in Torah, I mean, so who has time to fight over a parking spot? Nobody has time for that. I'm not saying now not to go to Betim when the time is right. There is halachot, there's chosh mishpat. But overall, the small fights that happen in our lives, when you're busy with Torah and mitzvot, when you know how much you can accomplish, there's no time for these things. When a person is bored and he doesn't realize how much Torah and mitzvot he has, that's when he starts fighting over every little small thing. Person's got to have his vision right. You got to accomplish more Torah and more mitzvot. I tell you one more shot, then I'm going to go back to this thing. One thing for sure is, Rabbi, I'm losing a lot of weight here. That's the one thing. I'll tell you one more shot. Imagine a lot of imagination of you guys. I don't want you to fall asleep as if you're dreaming. You know. <laughs> Imagine um, the wealthiest guy again, Elon Musk. Talk about Imuna. Imagine, for some reason, he hires you. Would you want to be hired by Elon Musk to work for Elon Musk? Imagine Elon Musk calls you up. Chacham, what's your first name? My name is Yassi. Yassi, and what's your name? Yitzchak. Yitzchak. Imagine Elon Musk calls you. Yitzchak, you've been promoted. Come work in uh, Tesla or Twitter. Come, 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 come. I told him no. You, you're going to tell him no? I told him oh, no. you already told him no? <laughs> I was going to get your autograph. You told no to Elon Musk. So imagine he calls you up. He tells you, come work for Tesla in my building. Not only in the same building where Elon Musk is, come to the same floor where he works. Psh, that's chashuv. Get promoted like that, oh. You go to the floor, it's your first day on the job, everyone is excited, your wife, your kids, your parents, woohoo, you work for Elon Musk. You go to your first job, first day of the job, you go in, you see Elon Musk is running around with papers, signing, signatures, screaming at this guy, do this, do that, do this, do that. And you tell yourself, What's he doing? He's so confusing. He says no to this guy, yes to this guy, yes to this guy, tomorrow for this guy, five minutes for this guy, he's signing this, he said, 
I'm so confused. Imagine you go to Elon Musk, you first day on your job, you go to Elon Musk, you tell him, Elon, with all due respect, Mr. Uh, Elon, you're so confusing. I think you're making a mistake here. Something here doesn't make any sense. He's going to look you, Yitzchak, and tell you, who do you think you are? First day of your job, say thank you even got called by me. Say thank you even in the building. Say thank you even in my floor. It's your first day of your job with no experience and you're telling me that you're confused? That's disrespectful. We come to this world. Hashem, the CEO of the world, Haya, Hove, Vehiye, always was around, always is around, always will be around. We come here, 2023, our whole life is considered one day on the job, by the way. It's very short. And we start telling Hashem, Hashem, why is this happening? How come this guy gets this, the other guy doesn't? How come this happened to me and to my friend didn't happen to me? Why, 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 why? Hashem is going to tell the person, Alo, relax, relax. You're coming in, kacha the first in the job, you start asking questions. Say thank you, you're even born. Say thank you, you were born, born Jewish born in the Jewish community, born to learn Torah, you know what you have a merit that is and you're asking questions. That's you. Ask what? Do your job in this world. What is our job in this world? To serve Hashem and follow the Shulchan Aruch. No questions on the Muna. Don't ask why, ask what. What does Hashem want me to do in this world? A person that really believes in God knows what he has to do. A person that doesn't really believe in Hashem, that's where the why questions start. Why this, why that, why this, why that. Don't worry. If you knew Hashem is next to you, you wouldn't be asking any why questions. You'll be too scared to ask the why questions. It's because you don't really believe Hashem is there, so you start debating God. Does God exist? God not exist. God exists? God exists. What's going on with you? You're not in reality. A person who's in reality that Hashem is really here doesn't have questions in the Muna. How did I get there? What are we talking about? Hanukkah? How did we get to this? Oh, back to the book. Okay, fine. Wait, how much time do I have? Okay, we'll do a few more minutes here. The Gemara in Pesachim tells us like this, Sabotai. Famous Gemara in Kuf Yud Chet Amun Aleph. Kashim is in Atov Shel Adam Kikiyat Yam Suf. Kiyat Yam Suf, the splitting of the sea, was not an easy task for human beings. Obviously, Hashem had to really step in and do one of the greatest miracles at all times. That is the splitting of the sea. Says the Gemara and Psachim. For a person to get mezonot, for a person to have panasa, you need Hashem's help 100%. Meaning, of course, Hashem does everything. But you need a kriyat yamsub type of miracle for a person to have parnasa. For a person to have the right means to have a good job, you need an open miracle. You need a nesa kriyat yamsub. It's another term of saying, it's not an easy thing to find the right job. Then the Gemara says in Sota, to find a zivug, to find the right beshert, the right wife. Kashel zivugan kikriyat yamsuf. To find the right spouse, to find the right wife. Oh, you need a big miracle. Kikriyat yamsuf, like the splitting of the sea. Says the Ben Ishchai, when the Gemara says that to have parnasa is hard like yamsuf, and to find your wife or the wife to your husband is hard like Yamsuf. It's not a one-time thing. It's not until you find your job, it's like Yamsuf, but then after that, it's easy, it's easy as pie. No. It's every single day when you're working, you have to understand, it's Hashem supplying you the money. It's Hashem supplying you the wealth, just like Hashem did Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. Hashem is the one giving you Parnasa. Don't think it's nature. Don't think it's automatic that you had money that month. It's Hashem giving you the money. So too says the Ben Yishcha when it comes to Azivug, when it comes to finding your spouse. It's not that it's hard like Yamsof. It's like splitting the seat to find the right wife until you find the right wife. It's like so hard. It's like splitting the seat. It's even after you get married. Every day of your marriage and every week is like Kirat Yamsof. It's a miracle to stay along. It's a miracle. Says the Ben Yishcha, Ben Adam Lechavero, to respect a wife and a wife and a husband, to respect your friends, is not a small task. You have to be aware that just like Kalei was in front of the sea when we left Mitzrayim, and we were stuck, the Egyptians behind us, and Yamsuf in front of us, and we're like, Where, what do we do? Where do we go? And then instead of screaming out to Hashem, 
and Hashem told them, just go, don't worry, I'm going to help you out. But they scared to Hashem, they had a Muna. Then the sea was split. So to a marriage, so to a Parnassah. Nothing is going to be automatic. Don't think you're just going to get along. Don't think you're just going to have parnasa. Nothing should be taken for granted. It's something you have to pray for. It's something you have to know that you need Hashem for to help you out. To have Shalom Bayit, you need Hashem. Not just therapy. Not just classes. Tefilot, real tefilot, real Shalom Bayit needs tefilot. To be nice to other people. It doesn't just happen naturally. A person has to pray for it. You have to know that you need Hashem. You need Emunah. You have to ask Hashem, please help me to be nice to my wife. Please help me to be nice to my husband. Please help me to be nice to my co-workers, to my neighbors, to my friends in yeshiva. It's something a person has to work on. It's a lifestyle. It's a miracle. It's not a natural thing. A person has to daven for it just like he daven for Kiyat Yamsuf. Just like we daven for the splitting of the sea. And we knew we had no choice but to pray. So too when it comes to Parnassah. So too when it comes to getting along with Adam and it's not automatic. There's no automatic button. It's not a robot. It's something that needs to be worked on. It's a vision. It's a vision. You've got to pray for it every single day to make sure that a person has shalom bite. You know, I once read a letter, beautiful letter, from Chacham Ovadia, about a person that was doing very well in business. He was very good at doing, like, startup businesses. You know how to set up a business, then sell it. Set up a company, then sell it. And one of the questions that he asked Chacham Ovadia, he told him, do you think I should start this business? Or this business. He wasn't sure between the two. Chamavadi told him, why do you think Hashem gave you such good brains to know how to start a business? Why did Hashem give you such a good mind? You think He gave it to you just to start businesses? Hashem gave you a good mind. 30% of it, use it for business. 70%, I want you to use it to build your family. Listen to those words. It's a tremendous thing. He's asking the rabbi, where should I do my business? Should I work on this? Should I build this company? I build this company. The rabbi's telling him, you're too busy using your talents of building and creating on the wrong things. Hashem gave you a mind of creation and to produce. Not for business. That's like 30% of your mind you should use for Parnassa. Hashem gave you that mind in order to create yourself to become a tzaddik. In order to be a good person at home. Use your talents and your vision of building at home. Not in your business, at home, become the CEO, become that builder that makes sure the employees are happy, the customers are happy, and the money's. Use your mind of building at home. Because if you're not going to use it for your house, it's going to fall apart. That's again a tremendous lesson. Ben Adam Chavero is not just a ha. Huh? It's like imagine starting a business. I just had somebody who started a business. He started a certain food store. He started what, Barak a month ago? The guy is never there. It's his, the guy is never there. He hired the worst workers. There's no sign on the wall. I called them up and said, I know, it's not the way you run a business. You know, you want your business to run well, you got to be there every day. You have to make sure the workers are good. It's not a kacha. It's not the way you start a business. You have to put your mind into it. Says Chacham how do you become a good person? How do you become that person that always thinks about the other person? The nice guy. The guy that builds other people, that's mechazik, that gives compliments, that's good to his wife, the wife, good to her husband, to the children. How do you become that person? It's not automatic. You have to be involved in the business every single day. Put your mind of production and building of becoming a tzaddik and a good person. Put your mind of becoming a tzaddik in your home. Become the CEO. Your business, your main business in life is how you treat other people and how you treat your wife and the wife to the husband. That's what you should use your talents for, not on money. You know, I once read an article from the famous um, rabbi, it was Chazabat Teshuvah, Arav Uri Zohar, Zechet Tzadavi Kadashivrach. He just passed away last year or two years ago. He was a famous actor in Israel for the Israelis here. If you remember in the 60s and the 70s, in the 80s, Rav Uri Zohar was a famous actor. He was like on top of Hollywood. There's no Hollywood in Israel, but he was like the number one guy in the movies. My parents remember him, my grandparents. They all remember Uri Zohar on TV. He was a famous guy. He had all the money he needs. Everything was good. Everybody knows that he was Chazeb Teshuvah. He decided on becoming Orthodox Jew. He became totally Orthodox. He went and learned for 20 years straight with Afshach, different rabbis. He became a very big tzaddik. His name was Rav Uri Zohar. Passed away last year. And one of the interviews I had with him, a non-religious Jew yet, asked the rabbi of Uri Zohar, you know, miss, in the movie world, you get to act. You get this production. 
there's cameras, there's scenes, there's action, lights, action, what does it say, lights, action, all these things. You told them, you don't, you don't miss that life. You went from being a movie star to like this all day, Gemara. It's not boring. You don't, you don't miss that life. And he told them, it's such a beautiful lesson. It's such a lesson. Such a beautiful answer. It's a beautiful lesson. He told them, the greatest production that I have, the greatest talent of my acting that I'm using it for is how I become a righteous person. Which means, just like when I was a movie star, you have to know how to act, how to do this move, what to say, how to say. It takes a lot of time and effort and talent. I use all that time and effort and talent, he told them. I use it for me becoming a tzaddik, becoming a good person. I'm a production of my life. My life is one big, big movie. And that's the movie that's going to count for Alam Abba. It's not that I left that world. This world is the real production of really keeping Shabbat, really being nice to others, really being good in Kashrut. For example, imagine you are about to say Lashon Hara about a person. You're not sure, is it Lashon Hara, is it not Lashon Hara? So the rule is when something, if you're not sure it's Lashon Hara, what's the rule? Don't say it. person wants to be Machmer, the best way to be Machmer, to be Shunj is Lashon Hara. Don't say it. So a person who knows how to act well, a person that knows in this world he was here to, to, to have a production of his life, even though he's about to say la shonara, be smart and use your mind to say, no, I'm not speaking la shonara. I'm going to be smarter. I'm not going to fall for the itzahar just for that split enjoyment. I'm going to say no. Or imagine a person, and that takes talent to think like that. You've got to put your time into your life to make those decisions. It doesn't come easy. Or imagine a person is traveling on vacation, and you know the food is not 100% uh, kosher. You're not sure. Some say it's good kashrut, some say it's not good kashrut. You're in Yehupasville. But you're starving, you know, when you're really hungry. The Yitzhahari comes in and tells you, don't worry, don't worry, it's good kashrut. <laughs> if a person puts his mind into it and he knows that he's got to run his business of his righteousness in this world, and he uses his decision-making business mind for Torah and mitzvot, you got to be strong and tell yourself, no, I'm not eating from that food. You just made another beautiful scene in the movie called Your Life, and you're going to see it in Olam Abba. Well, let's say a person walks home, and he had a hard day, and he can say bad comments to the children, to, and you can show yourself. And Vic de Miller said, he said, before he used to walk into his house, he would put his hand in the mezuzah, and he would dive into Hashem, Hashem, please help me. I should respect my wife and my children. It's an avoida. It's work, but under the chavero's work. He put his hand in the mezuzah and damit Hashem. Make sure I treat other people nicely. That was his tefilot. You know, they say over a story with the Chafetz Chaim, the Helege Chafetz Chaim. And I'm going to end off with this. The Helege Chafetz Chaim, Yom Kippur night. Can you imagine the Chafetz Chaim, the Kedusha, the Holiness, the Chafetz Chaim, the Mishnah Bura, the Shmirat Lashon, the God of Adar, Kedusha, Torah, Yerat Shemaim. Yom Kippur night. Just the holiest, Yom Kippur. They say over, now one time in yeshiva, after they finished a tefillot on Lel Yom Kippur, he was the last one in the shul after saying Tehillim, because some people finished Tehillim, Lel Yom Kippur, the whole tale, whole Sefi Tehillim. He walks out, and he notices a bachar, one yeshiva student, with his head on his arm like this, on the table. The Chafetz Chaim was thinking, why, what's going on? Maybe he fell asleep, and he wake him up to go to bed. Chafetz Chaim goes to him and tells him, what's going on? Oh, I forgot one big detail. The Chafetz Chaim did Tani Dibu on Yom Kippur. Tzadikim do tani dibu. They don't talk in Yom Kippur. Even after they finish praying, they don't say, hey, what's up? How's your fast? They don't, they don't, they don't talk on Yom Kippur. But over here, the Chafetz Chaim went out of his way and he asked the person, how can I help you? What's going on? Ends up being that the boy needed a chizuk. He wasn't tired. The boy was crying because he was away from family and he couldn't see his mother. It's a whole story. What did the Chafetz Chaim do? He didn't say, hey, I'm, I'm Chafetz Chaim. I'm holy. I got to go. That's not what he did. He sat with him, Rabbi the story goes, the whole Yom Kippur night talking to him until nets, until dawn, to Allah to Shachal. When people came back from their sleep to come dive in Yom Kippur morning, the Chafetz Chaim sat there, Yom Kippur night. You know what that means? That's an unbelievable story. Talk about the Chafetz Chaim, you know how busy he was? You know how much Torah he learned? His relationship with Hashem was, you can't even imagine how holy he was. He put everything aside on Yom Kippur? For what? To help out another Bachar, to help out another Jew that needed Chizuk. And he sat with him the whole Yom Kippur night to talk to him to make sure he's happy. That's an unbelievable story. 
and I'm talking to myself, person has to put an emphasis on treating other people nicely, not agav. An emphasis it has to be your vision, it has to be a priority. How did I respect other people today? How many compliments did I give my children or my coworkers? Did I say a good word? Did I compliment? How much? Did I go out of my way? Just like you make sure you put on tefillin, just like you make sure you say kiddush, just like you wash your four bread. But now the chaver has to become more physical, it has to become more tangible. How many compliments did you say today? How many good things did you help other people? But Adam the did you respect them? Did you go out of your way? It has to become more real, more real. Because says the Gaum of Vina and Olam Abba, a person who did not have Ben Adam the you can't even leave Gehenom. What does that show you? How important it is to Hashem, to God, that us, the human beings, really treat other people nicely. With real respect, real respect. Kavod, Kavod. Thank you so much for listening. Even though I have more to say, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you, thank you.